In today's episode, you will learn how one couple has grown a thriving business by talking about... Hey, hey, what is going on, Millionaire University? Welcome to another episode of the Millionaire University Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Williams. And today we are going to be talking about dinosaurs. Okay, we're not really talking about dinosaurs, but we are gonna be talking about how you can create a business by doing or teaching something that you are passionate about. Today, I connected with Garrett Kruger, who along with his wife, Sabrina, is co-host of the I Know Dino podcast, which is the world's largest dinosaur podcast. In this episode, we talk about how they have grown and monetized their podcast and how you can start growing and monetize a podcast of your own, should you choose to do so. We talk about the pros and cons of starting a podcast and what it takes and the kind of money that you can make. And we also just keep it really real and talk about some of the things that you might want to consider before starting a podcast. But regardless of if you have or are interested in starting a podcast, I have no doubt that you will get a ton of value out of this episode. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I give you the one, the only, Gary Kruger. Thank you so much for having me. My wife and I run I Know Dino, the big dinosaur podcast, and we've been doing that for eight years now, coming up on nine years. It started out as like a side project, you know, just sort of for fun, because we discovered we both like dinosaurs. And then over the years, it developed into making a little bit of money. And then eventually, now we both quit our day jobs, and we both work on it full time. So that's the elevator pitch for what we do. <laughs> I think that's the shortest intro I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've spoke sometimes, right at different meetings, I did real estate or whatever. And a public speaker I was there, someone who taught public speakers, and he came up to me. He's like, you did a really good job, but your intro was way too long. Your backstory. I'm like, okay, I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys love dinosaurs. You've always loved dinosaurs. You had jobs. You were an engineer. Is that right? Yeah. So I studied chemical engineering in college, and my wife studied communication. She was planning on being like a journalist, and she worked for the school newspaper. The newspaper we had at our college was actually daily, so it, it was pretty intense as far as school newspaper jobs go. But it got her really used to doing all sorts of journalism, and podcasting is basically a type of journalism. So when we started, she was like the one that knew this is how you talk about things. This is how you communicate science because she had published the science section for the newspaper and things like that. Whereas I didn't know anything. I knew how to read some of these big words and I was familiar with peer reviewed journal articles that we were reading, but that was basically all I was adding. It was largely her that started it. But you guys both always loved dinosaurs. Is that right? Yeah, we both loved dinosaurs as a kid, more than other kids, I would say. But neither of us were really into dinosaurs from the ages of maybe like 10 or 12 to 20. Like the teenage years, dinosaurs become uncool and you sort of like move on with your life. You do other stuff, or most people do. It's cool. Some people love dinosaurs that whole time, and we definitely support that. But for us, we forgot about them in the sort of Jurassic Park 3 era and the <laughs> long gap afterwards if there continue to be I think Jurassic the whole Park world movies. did I think yeah. you're like the whole world man I think part of it is your age and I think part of it is just pop culture right like yeah <laughs> yeah it sort of like fell off like the 90s there was like all these Jurassic Park movies there were so many new dinosaur discoveries for the first time in a long time so it was everywhere but in like the late 2000s there were still a lot of dinosaur discoveries happening but they didn't really make it to the public nearly as much as they did in the 90s yeah Interesting how it happened. I remember thinking, oh, people used to really care about dinosaurs, and now no one does. People used to care about space, and now no one does. But now it's both of them are coming back, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just depends who's doing what out in the world and what seems new and exciting gets a lot of the public. Yeah, fascinating. I was like, oh, we're on to like a tech era, and no one cares about that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you guys love dinosaurs. Now, when did you guys meet? So we met in college, actually at a party at Sabrina's house, because we went to sort of a party college. There was a lot of studying too, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she threw parties like almost every weekend. And I was friends with her friends, but we didn't meet for a long time. I like knew all her friends. She knew all my friends kind of thing. And then at one party, I finally ran into her and we didn't discover. So we started dating. We moved in together. We moved to the East Coast while she went to grad school and then 
during that time is when we rediscovered our love of dinosaurs because we went to the American Museum of Natural History a couple times. And after like the second or third time going, we were like, we both really like the dinosaurs here. And then it sort of started growing from that point. Okay, so you guys both collectively together, after you fell in love, you re-fell in love <laughs> with dinosaurs. It wasn't like you were yeah. dating and you started talking about dinosaurs and that's where the love connection was. It was yeah. kind of after the fact. It would make more sense. And a lot of people assume like, oh, you're both dinosaur people. So obviously that's how you connected. But we connected over all sorts of other random, you know, stuff like bands and things that a lot more common people <laughs> for people to connect over. And then dinosaurs came later. Because I listened to probably your most recent episode and I was like, oh my gosh, these guys are like dinosaur nerds, right? Like dinosaur <laughs> yeah. fanatics. Like this is like interesting to me. I was more interested because I'm not like, I'm not like dinosaurs. I watched Jurassic Park. My wife claims that she loves dinosaurs. But after I listened to your guys' podcast, I'm like, babe, you do not love dinosaurs. Like <laughs> you have no clue about dinosaurs. I was fascinated and interested kind of in some of the things you were talking about, but I was more fascinated with the way you talked about it and to realize that there's an entire group of people out there who are as geeky into dinosaurs as you guys are. The nice thing about the internet is you can find these like hyper specific niches for every category in the world because everybody loves one thing, you know, it could be like a specific car engine, it could be like you were saying space it could be dinosaurs, there's all these things. And if you're just walking around talking to people, you're going to be that one nerdy person who's really into it. And maybe when like a new news story comes out, people ask you questions about it. But other than that, you're just like way out there on your own. But with the internet and with podcasting, you can find that community of like really intense people who are very much into the same subject as you. That's awesome. So you fell in love, you've refound your love for dinosaurs, you got married, you had a dinosaur wedding, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> okay, very normal, very normal. <laughs> you had a dinosaur wedding, but you were still working full time. Like, where was the transition to thinking, oh, we should probably start a business teaching people about dinosaurs? Yeah, so I would say the first thing was I got laid off from a job and I was looking for more jobs. And my wife was basically like, don't look for more jobs, just do I know dino full time. So I did that. And then shortly after starting that, I went to get an MBA because I was like, I need to learn more business because neither of us had any business knowledge. And that seemed like a good way to do it. And it was helpful. It helped me a lot with negotiating and understanding contracts was like the biggest thing. There are definitely other ways to learn these things. But that's what I did. And then after that, I kept doing Ino Dino. And then after it continued to grow a little bit more, we hit a dollar amount that would basically pay our mortgage. That's when my wife quit. And then we started working on it full time. So now we're at like part two of the three of the story. Let's go to back to part two. We know how you met, fell in love with dinosaurs. How did you start I Know Dino? Like, did you want to start a business initially with dinosaurs? Or was it more of a hobby? Or what happened there? Yeah, so I would characterize my wife as like a serial entrepreneur. So she's tried lots of different businesses over the years. And a lot of them have to do with books and publishing and things like that. But one of them was she liked doing different websites, she really likes website design. So when we first discovered our love of dinosaurs, one of the things we noticed was, there are all these dinosaur museums all over the place, there's hundreds of them in the US. But they're really hard to find because a lot of them are kind of small and they don't necessarily have good websites, don't have good SEO. So we decided to make a website where we would have a map of all the dinosaur museums. And it was mostly self-serving because we wanted to go to them. And we're like, we should compile this map and then we'll be able to find these things when we're taking a road trip or we're visiting a city or something. Sabrina started that basically. And that's where the name I Know Dino came from because that was a domain that was available so we did that for a year or two, and we did a few posts here and there, sort of like, there's this new dinosaur, or hey, 10 things about dinosaurs. And then after a little while, we started seeing all this news about dinosaurs, and I was looking for a podcast because I listened to a lot of podcasts that covered all these dinosaur discoveries, and there wasn't one. That was sort of like the, maybe there's a need for this. We want it, and maybe someone else wants it. So we decided to actually start the dinosaur-focused podcast because there weren't any at the time. Gotcha. So knowing Sabrina was a serial entrepreneur and had a lot of ideas for business, it sounds like it was kind of a combination of this is something I'm interested in. This is something I love. I'm passionate about. I want this to exist anyway. 
And if there's a chance that I could share with other people, which is cool and make some money from it, then awesome. Let's dig in and see what happens. Definitely. Yeah. It's that thing people often say where it's like, you need that combination of what you're interested in and what the world is willing to pay for. (laughs) So, well, what I love is you guys, what I call like entered the corridor, you took action on something. And then from that action, you got feedback and you realized, okay, we're learning a lot. We're doing some cool things. But, and I think I heard you mention this in another podcast, there's not quite as many eyeballs right now on this specific thing. They've kind of moved over to social media and stuff like that. I think you mentioned But then you're like, there's not a podcast. Let's try a podcast. So it's kind of the whole, you know, throw a few things at the wall, see what sticks, and then kind of double down on that. Is that somewhat accurate? Definitely. I think we started the website in 2013, I would say. And then by 2013, there were not a lot of people going to like new blogs. It was everybody's going Facebook, everybody's going to Instagram. (laughs) There There was a time in like the 90s and the early 2000s where you could put a blog and make that a full time living just from the ads running on a blog. But we're not really there anymore. So we started the podcast. Let's kind of get into teaching session, if you will, like the masterclass part of this. Let's talk about how to start a podcast, how to grow, how to monetize, and part of that being how you guys did it. And then I think you guys have a podcasting course as well, which... Yeah, we're not really doing the podcasting course anymore. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that was another idea of my business development wife (laughs) that we tried, (laughs) but we pulled back on it. Okay, but I love that. That's important too, because you pivoted from that. Sometimes what I notice with a lot of entrepreneurs, there's a lot of groups of different people, right? The 1% is the 1% for a reason. But first off... You have most people who don't even recognize or see opportunity or they don't take risks. They just don't know what's available. Then you have another group who knows there's a lot of things out there, but they never take action. So you guys took action. I mean, sounds like in part, thanks to your wife, but you sounds like you were on long for the ride. So good for you. So you guys took action. And then there's another group who just shiny object. They're doing like a hundred things and they try to do all of them and then they don't get a lot of traction. So it sounds to me like you guys have tried out a few things, but you're cutting what isn't working, right? What isn't working as well? Or or what maybe you don't love as much? Because obviously there are people who do podcast courses and they make a lot of money from it. But it sounds to me, and this kind of reminds me of where I'm at right now, you guys were just super passionate about creating amazing podcasts and having that be your main focus and then monetizing that. Is that more or less? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you're right about the shiny thing, want to try new stuff. I think you need both of those. You need that excitement about trying new things. And I think we're similar to you and your wife, where it's like, my wife is the shiny new thing, I'm going to go do that. And then I'm the more realist one where it was like, well, let's see which things are working and pull back on the things that aren't working. Yep. And that push and pull, eventually, you end up with things that are successful. Yeah, my wife and I were totally opposite of you guys. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) You know, (laughs) my newest idea from yesterday, by the way, you're now an owner in Millionaire University. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> You're an unofficial official owner of Millionaire University because my recent idea, and I kind of had this idea for a while, but just yesterday I made it more unofficially official, is anyone who comes on the podcast for an interview gets 100 shares of stock in Millionaire University. So that's my latest idea. You'll probably hear more about the details in a few weeks. But <laughs> cool. That's a fun idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big believer in abundance. What's a way that we can compensate the people who help grow Millionaire University? And I have this vision that Millionaire University, some people might laugh at this, but I really think it can happen. But not everything's happened that I thought could happen. But I believe like Millionaire University can become a billion dollar company, right, over the next 10 years. So if it does, your stock will be worth a hundred times what it is right now. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a fun way to get people to help want to make content and be a part of the movement. And I see this in Bitcoin and Tesla and other companies. When people have ownership in it, they're promoting it and they're talking about it. And I think, hey, why not reward the people who help in that? So anyway, that's one of my latest ideas. But yeah, I got a new one every day. (laughs) Yeah, you need the new ideas because without the ideas, you've got nowhere to go. Totally. And you have to try new things. But the hard part is always when you say like, oh, this isn't working and stopping and like actually giving up on it. I think of like Shark Tank too, where there's always somebody comes in and all the experts are looking at them and going like, 
no, <laughs> you need to put your energy into something yeah. else. Like I see that you're passionate. I know that you work hard, but do something else. Let's talk about that for a second though, because I think there is a time and a place and there's a thousand stories or million stories on each side of the coin of that, where everyone told you no, and you kept going or people told you no, and you kept going and it didn't work out. Like, I guess they, neither one of us probably know the answer, but do you have any thoughts on that? How do you know when to keep going and how do you know when to cut bait? So I do it, and it's probably because I, I have a pretty scientific approach to a lot of things. And also marketing is usually more of a scientific, want to do actual experiments and sort of know what your outcomes are expected to be. So what I like to do, and the way we kind of do it now is we meet once a month and we sort of go over how things are going, but we'll pick like a timeline. So we'll be like, okay, we're going to look at how well this works for six months. And then if it's not getting any traction in six months, we're going to cut it. Because if you don't have like a predefined time, it's so easy to be like, well, let's just try a little longer. Let's try a little longer. Let's try it. Maybe this new idea will work. But if you have that predetermined and it's not set in stone, obviously, if it's like, oh, but there's this huge thing happening next month and it might be a good opportunity. But in general, it's like if you have that timeline, which is what we did with our podcasting course, we we're like, okay, we're going to do one cohort. We'll see how that goes. And we got a couple of people through it and it was fun but it was way more work than it was worth for us. So we were like, okay, time to cut. Yeah, what I gather from you guys is you're just creating amazing podcasts, which, hey, I mean, everyone has what, what the main focus of their business is. Some people do podcasting as a side to support their podcast course or what they're doing, right? For you guys, like your main thing is the podcast and then everything else you do is to support that, it seems like, which anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's 100% right. And it is good, like you were talking about pivoting earlier, to have that sort of in mind, because it doesn't have to always stay the same focus. Like we started the podcast sort of as an offshoot of a website. And the idea was like, well, we'll get more people to go to our website, as the podcast was sort of the thought in the back of our mind. And then it switched. Now the website drives to the podcast. And if we got huge on YouTube, we'd probably have the podcast drives to YouTube. And you know, like it could yeah. just, it can always change. How would you, if you were talking to someone how to start a podcast, what would you tell them? What are the things they need to start a podcast? Basically, I mean, you've probably said this too. All you really need is a microphone and something to record that microphone on, be it a cell phone. The easiest thing I think is this piece of equipment called the Zoom P4. It's like 150 to 200 bucks. It's got good preamps and it does XLR, which is a lot of big jargony words, but <laughs> it makes it easy to record. No, I love it. And the truth is, we've never done like a best practices, podcast practices on the show before yet. So this would be a fun 101. And it's true, you don't need a ton of crazy equipment, you just need something to record audio in. And then I would say, start right now, yeah. I don't recommend that everyone starts a podcast either. <laughs> so <laughs> we're doing this for people who want to start a podcast. But I don't recommend everyone starts a podcast. I've seen tons of people think oh, I'm gonna go start a podcast, I'm gonna get rich. Like that is not what we're teaching you here right now. A podcast can be something to help with your business. And if that's something you're interested in, these are some of the best practices, but it's not necessarily for everyone. <laughs> so yeah, I would say one of the big things when we were doing our podcast course, our first big lesson was like, figure out what you have a passion about enough that you can talk about it basically every week indefinitely. Because if you're not passionate about it, you're going to stop and then like, it's not even worth starting because you need to do it for years in order to get to a scale where it's worth all that effort. And if you can't imagine talking about that topic for years, it's totally pointless totally. to even get into it. Totally. And that's how I am with what do I do in my free time if I can? I like helping people and I like talking about business and I like playing pickleball. And sometimes I like to try to learn how to surf, which I fail at a lot. But <laughs> yeah, other than that, it's like spend time with my family and I love talking about business. So why not talk about business and try to do on a podcast? I love systems and processes and I love interacting with people and meeting people. And yeah, so it works great. And then you guys love dinosaurs. <laughs> so mm -hmm. It's awesome. I would last like one episode if I was trying to create a dinosaur podcast. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'd be done. There's no way. For me, it's like, like I was talking about the new shiny thing. I feel that way about researching stuff. So I could do a podcast, I feel like on just about anything, because I find everything endlessly fascinating. But for my wife, she's more particular in her interests, which is how we ended up on dinosaurs, because it's like, well, that's the overlap. But I could do one on, you know, like electric cars or chemistry or whatever, you know, I've got totally, I love all that stuff. And then I think also know your situation and know why you're doing 
the podcast. So like for me, like we don't need to make money from the podcast right now. And in fact, we're investing like 40 grand a month on advertising the podcast. We're just in a spot where we can do that. Like we worked really hard for 18 years and now things have tides have kind of turned to where we're more the investors. Right. And so we don't have to make money right away. If we did, like we'd be screwed, you know, because <laughs> we're not yeah. making any money right now. <laughs> you guys, on the other hand, you really enjoyed it. It was a hobby. And then it eventually did take off. So, but for me, I don't just do the podcast to make money and because I like it. I do it because it grows my network. And we took a few years off and I recognized, oh, my network is kind of not as strong as it used to be, which I was fine with that. So it's like, sweet, I'm taking some time off. But I was like, wow, like I reach out to people. I don't really know who to reach out to. <laughs> so it's like, let's rebuild the network. And it's amazing just in doing this for a couple months, how many people I've connected with that can now be a part of growing this movement that we're trying to create. So yeah, you're right. There are a lot of reasons to start a podcast. And they're not all just like, I want to be the next Joe Rogan, you know, totally. <laughs> I want to make all the money. There's, there's networking, there's learning new things, there's having fun, there's all sorts of different things. But you have to be like you said, you have to know what that is. And you have to make sure that it actually works for you in your own life. Totally. And if you have an interview style podcast, which I know you guys is, isn't mainly well, it is a little bit. But if you do, it's a great chance to be able to reach out and be able to talk to someone that you normally maybe they wouldn't take your call just because they have a lot going on or whatever. Absolutely. Right? I think for us, our favorite thing is interviewing people because like you said, you get to meet these awesome people. You also from our perspective, we didn't study dinosaurs. So in the early days, we could just ask our dumb questions like we were in a lecture hall, you know, like the kid keeps raising his hand like, hey, what, what about this? What about this? I can't figure this out. But then when we survey our audience, we basically found we have two different groups. We have the group that really like the interviews and we have the group that really just want to hear us talk. So we kind of do both because if we were in a bigger niche, we'd probably pick one and be like, okay, we're going to be the interview show or we're going to be the just talking show. But dinosaurs is kind of a small niche. So we want both. <laughs> we want everybody still sticking around and we enjoy the interviews. So yeah, we're going to keep doing them. I love that. And I think that's huge. Do like what you love to do, right? But you got to make sure it makes money too. If you don't need money, that's fine. <laughs> but I think the goal of Millionaire University is to help you make money. So I think we're, we're sticking with that theme. And then part of it is self-serving. Like there's questions I legit want to ask you. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's like you get it. That's, that's another benefit. So, all right, we've gotten really far in this course so far. So you get a microphone and then what do you do with those recordings? So you got to edit them. I have heard podcasts which are not edited or barely edited. And that is not the approach I would take. I think it sounds a lot better for almost all topics. There are some where it might work okay doing live, if you're, especially if you're really experienced and you don't make a lot of mistakes and you're really on top of it, like expert broadcaster level, maybe you don't need a lot of editing. But in general, most of us need editing. I know I do a lot of editing. I think I heard that you do some editing too. I do a lot of editing. And we're, anyway, we're trying to outsource that as much as we can because it's one of the things I teach people not to do is all these things that take a ton of time. And anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> Yeah, outsourcing is important. But in the beginning, if you're trying to do it cheaply, you can edit on your own. There are tools like Descript is a pretty good one that makes it pretty easy. Hindenburg is another really good one if you prefer a slightly more traditional like waveform editor. If you're ever editing music and that's sort of how you're getting into podcasting, I might use something like that or Reaper. There's a million of them. Anyway, pick one, watch YouTube tutorials on how to edit <laughs> and then start editing. And then the big thing that a lot of people miss is the loudness so there is a thing where it's called loudness standards. It's not the same as volume, but basically what it is is your file has a certain volume or loudness relative to other files. And you need them all to be similar because otherwise when people are listening to a podcast and they play one and then they play yours, odds are yours is going to sound super quiet if you don't do this. <laughs> so there are a lot of tools to do it. One of the big ones is called Auphonic but it's built into things like Descript. You can do it in Isotope. There's a lot of ways, but you got to make sure it's loud enough. People rarely complain about it being too loud, but they very often complain if it's too quiet because they can't hear you and then they're going to likely stop listening. So this is something I heard you talk about and it really stood out because we try to do some leveling for our shows, but I have no doubt that people get on and they'll listen to one and they'll listen to another one and they got it like, ah, it's like <laughs> they got yeah. turned down. What's the standard level? So there are different standards depending on who you ask. The loudest one is minus 14 decibels or minus 14 luffs. It's called, that's what I think YouTube uses. 
and maybe Spotify. I'm not sure on that one. The quietest you get is like negative 21. That's where audiobooks are. They're a little bit quieter in general. Mm. And then some of the places that went like audiobook to podcast still hang on to that. We use minus 16, which is sort of in the middle. And that's what I think most people use. That's what I recommend. And then if you do that loudness and it sounds crazy bad because everything just sounds sometimes it clips. It's, I'm getting really into the weeds, but you might have to do a little bit of compression before that. So a lot of these different pi, like Descript has a built-in compressor. You can go in and figure out how to do a little bit of compression. It'll make you sound great. You do the loudness. Everyone will be able to hear you. If you did some editing, those three things combined, you'll have a good sounding podcast, better than most podcasts. That's awesome. I'm not very techie. I don't know a lot of the, We use Descript and I didn't even know you could do that stuff in Descript. So I think Descript, some of them, when you import the files by default, will do a little bit of leveling automatically. So it might be doing that in the back end, and then you don't have to worry about it. What are some of the different hosting platforms? One of the biggest one is Libsyn. Then there's also Anchor is like a free one. And then there's a lot of smaller ones. So back in the day, we had Libsyn. And then we did, uh, I, I want to say, not is Buzzsprout? That's not one, is it? Or is it? Buzz something. I think yeah, it might something. be Buzzsprout. <laughs> I'll go back and edit that part. <laughs> but did like a magic leveling thing. But now we're using Megaphone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that one does the levelating. So I think my wife puts it in Auphonic or Levelator. Anyway, I know you mentioned Auphonic. But I love hearing those different decimal things. I'm going to check that out. Because when I heard you say that, I'm like, oh, man, if we did a survey like you guys did with your audience... I guarantee you that would be one of the complaints. Yeah. We forgot to do it for like a month. And then we had a review on Apple. And it's, it is good to read your reviews just at the very least to notice stuff like this. Somebody said like, I love the podcast, but the last few episodes have been so quiet. And I looked at it and we were at like minus 32 decibels. So it was the sort of thing where it's like you turn it up to 100 and you can still barely hear it. So I was like, oh, no, it's easy to go back and adjust them and then replace the files. So I mean, I'm clearly a very loud person. And I'm so I'm looking at like our audio levels here and mine is definitely going way higher than yours. <laughs> so <laughs> we like to record you want like they call it a little bit of headspace. So you don't want your level to be hitting the top or going into the red when you're talking because then it distorts and there's no way to fix that. But it's easy to make it louder. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, at least mine's not hitting the red. I always was told like you want to be in the yellow, but I didn't know that you could be more quiet and then go louder. You could be in that's... the green. It's fine. Oh, okay. Huh. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know. I always tell my wife like, hey, you're not in the yellow. Get in the yellow. <laughs> well, it can be good too, because if you have two people talking and you're in like the same area and one person's a lot louder, you'll end up on their mic and then they'll sound like really quiet even when you do boost it. Awesome. You guys use Libsyn or? We used to use Libsyn. We switched to Art19, which is now owned by Amazon. I think you might still be able to join. The reason we switched to them was getting into the monetizing part of podcasting. They do something called dynamic ad insertion, which a lot of podcasts do these days. It's really handy because basically rather than when you're listening to a podcast and they sort of just transition and they just keep talking, that's a baked in ad if you just talk through the ad while you're recording the episode. But the problem with that is when you are growing or later in the future and you want to advertise a new sponsor and there are people listening to those old episodes, they're hearing these ads that are completely irrelevant because it's probably for some promo that ended like years ago. If you do dynamic ad insertions, you basically just pause for a few seconds, then you have it automatically insert an ad at that point. And it's really nice for shows like ours and yours where there's a lot of content in the back catalog. It's not just news. So people aren't like, oh, this is old news. I don't care. There's still good information back there. People will still listen to it. So it's nice to be able to monetize the back catalog if you're trying to monetize. Or even if you're just trying to promote your own business or like you have a new book coming out or something, it's nice to be able to insert that and say, hey, just wanted to let everybody know I've got a book coming out. And it's nice to know that everybody listening to your podcast, regardless of which episode is hearing that message. See, guys, you don't really have to totally know what you're talking about. You just got to talk to someone who does know what they're talking about. <laughs> Let, have someone do it. Who knows what they're talking about? And you could just change. Like you said, we both started on Libsyn. Libsyn is really easy to switch away from, which is actually one of the things we said in our course. Like if you can't decide, go with Libsyn because they're very ethical and they're very good about letting you take your podcast elsewhere. So it's like five bucks a month. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, everything we've used, I know you can do that as well because we're spending money to advertise 
In fact, I don't know if it's still today, but yesterday, basically any episode you listen to, he talked about our podcasting, which I thought was insane, right? So I'm like, I didn't even reach out to you during this time when this podcast came out. But you're totally right. People go back and they binge and they listen to podcasts from the beginning. And there's a lot of content in there, a lot of value that you can get because we send, essentially were paying for how many listens they got. It didn't matter on what show or when. Or, so I thought that was pretty interesting. They just take them out, put them in, take them out. Yeah, it's better for the advertisers too, the way we sell it. And if you go to a podcast conference too, they'll say like, gets better traction when it's a relevant up-to-date ad because some sponsors want to say, well, I want to be permanently in there. I don't want you deleting our ad. And it's like, well, it's going to be irrelevant. <laughs> this way you can have the urgency. You can be like, do this by the end of July. Otherwise, you're never going to get a chance is a lot better than like, hey, I really like this brand. Or like advertising a podcast course that you no longer have, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so decide what topic you want to talk about. And the truth is, change it up if you want. I don't know. I know you got to be consistent. I know you got to do stuff, but it just depends. We talked about that. Try something out, change it up. To me, a lot of people don't start something because they don't have the whole end in mind. The truth is, you're going to get your voice more. You're going to get a better understanding. That's another reason why I started the podcast. Because when I started teaching people how to flip houses, I realized I know how to flip houses, but I don't know how to teach people how to flip houses. And it takes time. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to get my sea legs back under me with teaching people about business. I kind of forget how to even teach my kids how to start a business. So I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to interview people. We're going to share what's in our mind. And then it starts to become like you get word tracks and you get kind of more familiar with it. So there's a lot of reasons to, I think, to starting a podcast or creating content or taking action. Yeah, definitely. I hate listening to our early episodes because we didn't know what we were doing. And it's so bad for my ears. But other people don't really mind. People are pretty forgiving. If you're teaching them something they care about, if it's something interesting to them, they're not going to be nitpicking like, oh, you missed this thing, you use the wrong technical term here, whatever. It's kind of fun for some of them, because someone will say like, oh, I like grew with you, like I learned with you. As you were learning podcasting, I was learning this stuff from you. So it's okay. You got to be able to jump in and 100%. start like you were saying. And you could be sharing a topic, you could be sharing your journey, you know, don't ramble too much, but every once in a while, talk about what's going on in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So so let's talk about monetization. And we'll talk about growing and monetization. We'll just kind of talk about it together. <laughs> yeah. We literally rotate those two things. For a long time, we had that written on our whiteboard, like grow and monetize. Like you got to grow and you got to monetize. And we just sort of cycled through those focuses. How should people grow and monetize? Because it come hand in hand. If you don't have a lot of listeners, it's going to be hard to monetize, right? So how do you grow and monetize a podcast? Well, I think you're definitely doing it the right way. You want to grow first <laughs> in the cycle of growing and monetizing. You have to grow first because like you said, you can't monetize no audience. Totally. And then the way to grow, there's a lot of ways to grow. I think the current best thoughts are you want to go on other podcasts. You want to collaborate with other people like you were talking about. Have people on your show, go on other people's shows. New people will hear you as well as people that come on your show will tell people on their podcast or their audience, even if they don't have a podcast, that they were on a show. And that's a huge help. That's probably the biggest thing you can do. But there's only so much of that that you can do. So if you want to do other stuff, you can do things like either have some sort of membership thing where you're offering extra stuff to people. And that could be free. So you could give away like free stuff to like newsletter people when they subscribe, you can have a website that you direct people to that also, or I should say, if you have a website people are going to, you can direct them to the podcast with some sort of benefit. Just anything you do that also adds value, think about how you can give that to people in order to direct them back to your show. Sort of like we made a free book that on every page, basically at the bottom, it's like, listen to this episode if you want to learn more. So that's another way you can do it. That's been downloaded, I think, like 20,000 times or something. Oh, it's awesome. We didn't get listeners from every one of them, but we got some listeners from it. And it was knowledge that we already had. So putting it together into an ebook took a couple of weeks. There's a lot of ways to be creative. The main thing is if you're giving away stuff for free and it's valuable, people might come for more. And later on, when you want to monetize, they might be like, oh, yeah, I know this person has good information. I'm willing to pay some money to get even more of that information. I love it. And that's how exponential growth happens, right? At the beginning, you feel like you're pushing this heavy car up a hill. <laughs> and then the hill starts to get a little more flat. And then because you have, it's like you're growing the podcast and you're growing your email list and you're 
growing all then they all kind of grow together or you're doing a book or something like that and then they build off each other you have this like compounding effect so yeah i heard somebody at a recent podcast conference say something like it's a lot harder to go from zero to fifty thousand monthly downloads than it is to go from one million to two million <laughs> totally <laughs> Totally, but it like makes you a lot more money going from one to two million, right? Yeah. But it's all about getting that traction and getting going. And I think because sometimes in my mind, I am a born entrepreneur, basically. And I've never understood why someone wouldn't have their own business. But I think a big part of it is in our society, we're just kind of taught like you go one step at a time, right? And in entrepreneurship, it's kind of like you go without food for a year and then you get it's like feast or famine, right? Type yep. thing. Exactly. And like when we started our podcast back in 2015, everyone we talked to was like, what's a podcast? And like anybody who didn't know what a podcast was, or even people that did are like, you make money at that. There's also a lot of just sort of like, you have to be confident in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, it, there are enough people out there telling you like, you should really do this other thing, that it's going to be hard to keep going. Totally. Let's talk about that making money on the podcast. So you're growing your show and there's a point where you're like, okay, let's try to make some money. What are the different ways you guys are monetizing your podcast? Yeah, so we have two big major ways and they're pretty common, both of them. The first one we already talked about is advertising. So we reach out to different brands that have dinosaur related stuff. There are a lot of <laughs> brands that have dinosaur related stuff. This applies to most niches too, because there are people that are making books about it. There are people that have made videos or other content about it. There's people who are probably selling some sort of physical good for people that are interested in that topic. And then there are the general categories where it's just people that are want ears on it and are not too picky about which podcast it's advertised on. So like you'll hear things like HelloFresh or mattresses and things like that. You'll hear those on like every podcast you listen to because they realize that basically anybody could be their customer. So you can look for those types of advertisers. That's one big stream. Where would you recommend to look for advertisers? Way that's been the most successful for us is finding brands that we are sort of uniquely positioned to communicate their message. Or we can find an angle where it's like, oh, I bet this brand might appreciate this about the way we could communicate this and reaching out to them directly. So, so you, you can find niche brands. And then I know there are some specific places you can look or companies that can help you get sponsors, right? Yeah. Have you guys ever done that? Or do you can you speak to that for anyone who who's listening who, to give them some more guidance and direction? Yeah, I think Megaphone does that. You were saying you're on Megaphone. I think you can do that. One of the ways, this is like a, sort of a lower income version, but there's dynamic ad insertion, or sorry, not dynamic, programmatic ad insertion, which is a type of dynamic ad. And those are ones where you don't even read it. So the advertisers just buy space and it just shows up in your show seemingly magically. Those are like commercial breaks that you'd hear on radio or TV. And those are the easiest because it's most hosts is just flipping a switch. Then another level to that is you can get a basically an advertising agent who will go out, try to sell your show, take a cut of the value of the ads that they sell, then you have to usually host read it on your show. And there's one that you can DIY called Podcorn, where it's just like podcorn.com, I think, if it's not .fm or something unusual. And you go there and basically there's a list of sponsors or potential brands. They say what they're looking for, what kind of ads they're looking for, and you can send them a pitch, basically. You can say like, oh, I'll do this many episodes for this many dollars, and this is why my audience would love what you're selling. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's podcorn.com. Okay, it's a good one. We've gotten some sponsors through there over the years. Awesome, yeah, I think you mentioned, you might need to reach out to a few of them. Yes. But it's like, still, if they're basically saying, we're interested in doing this, and so what, you got to reach out to 10 to get one there, at least you know, there's an interest there versus the other approach is reaching out to people who may or may not be interested, but they're in your niche. So it's like there's pros and cons to both, I think. Yeah, in the beginning, we had a lot more luck on Podcorn, because there were a lot of companies who are like, what's a podcast? Why would I advertise on a podcast? But now that more people know, you're finding a lot of success. It's once again, it's the exponential growth thing. It's the, the compounding effect. Like now people know who you are and you probably, it's probably not as hard to get. Definitely. Yeah, it's totally flipped. Now it's easier to go to like somebody who has like a paleontology dig program mm. and say like, oh, 
we'll direct people to your dig program if you advertise on our podcast. And they're like, oh yeah, you have a podcast about dinosaurs? Sure. That's so cool because I've been studying you guys last couple of days, but it's interesting how like a show I heard was from earlier this year and then over maybe a year and a half ago or whatever, right? So it's like, it's cool to hear the journey continue to evolve. <laughs> and you <laughs> yeah. guys started out, you went on like a trip and you would just talk to the people at these museums. <laughs> That's like how, like, let's just do whatever it takes, right? Yeah, and I'm sure you're very well acquainted with this and probably talked about it many times. But when you make a face-to-face -face connection with someone and they know you're a real human and not like a bot sending them an email, you have a much higher success rate in that sale. I was going to try to make a face-to-face -face connection with you, but you won't let me see your face. I don't even know what you look like. I've heard you many times. I'll just have to go online and see what you look like. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we switched. Well, this is uh, inside baseball, but we're working on building a studio in our backyard. But... It's taken us a while to get somebody to put down the like concrete foundation. I'm going to do most of it myself, but I do not trust myself to pour concrete that everything is built on. And it's taken long enough that eventually my wife said, we need to put our daughter in her own room, which was our office. And so now our desks are jammed in our bedroom. And I haven't gotten the, we just did that like a week ago. I haven't gotten the video and everything set up. Small <laughs> tangent. What are some ways to get good audio? It's interesting. Right before this show, we're actually selling our house. So I had to take all the junk that was out of my closet, which is where I record. My closet's way too big. And I'm like, okay, the last podcast I did had too much echo. Everyone bring your mattresses in my room. So having the kids sleep on mattresses so they don't ruin their beds. So when people come to see the house. And I'm like, bring a bunch of junk in my office. And then afterwards, we're going to take it all out because we're showing the house. But it really helps. So what are some of the things that people can do to have good recording audio? Or are you going to do with your studio? The number one thing for us, we live like 200 feet from a freeway. So we had to get new windows. The first thing is getting rid of the background noise. And then the next thing, like you said, is the echo and sort of that room treatment. So the best thing you can do, the best cheap thing you can do, what we did is you can just buy fiberglass. It's like hard fiberglass. It's not the kind of like pink fluffy fiberglass that you staple in. It's called Owens Corning 703 is the main one. And basically, it's like rigid fiberglass, and it's really good at absorbing sound. So you stick it up on the walls. I have one stuck all over the walls in this room now. And it makes a huge difference. When we switched rooms, I was like, Oh, we've got a big mattress. It's our bedroom. It's got a huge mattress in it. Maybe that'll help. And I went to record one thing and all I could hear was echo. And I was like, Okay. And then I put up these panels. I've got like, eight of them or something. And putting them in the corners makes more of a difference than putting them on flat surfaces. But yeah, there's a whole thing to it. But basically, if you'd buy like six of these things, I bought them for like 150 bucks. I bought a few yards of this really thin fabric at Walmart for like five bucks, wrapped them up. And then for yeah, for like 150 bucks, I basically got rid of the echo in the room. So it's awesome. And that's more, you know, it's kind of an advanced thing for everyone listening. Like the key is get started. As you make money from your business, you can invest more into it and do more things and stuff. What we did at the beginning was we recorded under a comforter. That also works if you are starting with zero dollars. <laughs> if you don't mind suffocating. And yeah. I know we talked about doing like a lot of editing, but I remember like Russell Brunson, he started his driving to and from his office on his phone, you know? So it just depends if what your main focus is, the time and effort and energy that you're going to put into something. If it's just a side thing that you're doing, because also it's good to have content for you. Maybe you have a different funnel that's getting you clients but you can direct them to the podcast just so they can learn more about you. Sometimes people aren't ready to make a buying decision, but if they know more about you, they can go check out your podcast. So maybe it's just a way that people can go learn more about you. And Yeah, that's true. Make sure you're the, that you're not a bot. <laughs> exactly. Totally, right? <laughs> Let's talk about how much money like can you make from sponsorships. I mean, the truth is to make decent money on sponsorships, you need to have... Not need to, but generally speaking, there's always the case where you can find the one person who's willing to pay you a bunch of money for a couple hundred downloads per show. But the truth is you need to have pretty good volume. Like what kind of numbers are we looking at with sponsorships? I would say on Podcorn, you can go real low because a lot of these brands on there are like, we have $500 to spend. And so if you're doing like a $25 CPM, meaning $25 for every thousand people that download... You can say, I'll put you in, you know, 10 episodes, give me a hundred bucks. That's only a couple hundred downloads an episode. 
And some people will go for that. It can feel really good. We did a little bit of that in the very early days. And it felt really good to just get some money for our podcast. I think the first one we sold was maybe $500 being in like three episodes kind of thing. Cool. That's cool. It was a pretty high CPM, but that was one of those museums. So they were like, yeah, your audience is exactly aligned with ours. And it's interesting when you start to think about it, there are companies that basically don't have a lot of budget. So they don't want a huge number of listeners because they can't afford your show once it has a huge number of listeners. So we actually went through a really awkward transition that we're just finally getting out of (laughs) where it was like we were too big for these niches where they were like, I can't pay thousands of dollars, I can pay hundreds of dollars. But we were too small for the big advertisers who are like, I don't even want to talk to you unless you're big time $5,000 plus. Maybe someday podcasting will get advanced enough to where they can distribute this many to this and this many to that. Or maybe you can. I don't know. Yeah. That's sort of what like Megaphone and some of those and some of those networks sell a group. But it doesn't make sense for you to work with someone for just a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, we've done it and it does bring in some money, but you get a much higher CPM when you're doing it directly because your specific show is always going to have like a lot of details to it that are unique to your show. And if it doesn't, you're probably not being that successful. So there's something about your show that makes your show your show. And if you go to an advertiser and you say, this is what I'm all about, and it's just like what you're all about, they're probably willing to pay more than if they're going to an agent who's saying, well, I've got this group of shows and they're all in business. And it's like, okay, well, I'll give you this dollar CPM and we'll see if it works. Because if you have a higher conversion rate, that's what really matters at the end of the day. CPM for when listening means like cost per thousand which is interesting because you would think it means like cost per million yeah it's mil which i think is french yeah is it french or is it you're smarter than i am i just believe whatever you say (laughs) it's spelled like it's french i was like oh is it latin or something but yeah okay could be latin yeah yeah so let's talk about the other ways that you monetize your podcast yeah yeah so advertising is on a good advertising sales month, the biggest one, bad advertising month, it's the subscription, which is why it's nice to have the subscription because it's this nice baseline of money that sort of lets you sleep at night because it's like, okay, my mortgage is paid for. Regardless, I might have to eat ramen this month, but <laughs> at least I know I'm not going totally destitute. So we use Patreon and Patreon is, I always described it like Kickstarter, but ongoing is sort of how it works. You give a specific person some money and then they'll give you some benefit on a monthly basis. And I like it a lot, but there are other options out there, especially for podcasting now. There are some where basically you make a separate set of content on like a premium feed and then people pay money on a monthly basis and they get access to that feed. So I would say those are the two main competitors. There's like the feed-based ones and there's Patreon, which can do a myriad of different benefits. I love comparing it to Kickstarter because Kickstarter, it's like they really want to support you, Mm -hmm. but you also can entice them to support you more or more people to support you by getting some added benefits. But ultimately it comes from they want to support you. And just like Kickstarter, you want to have different levels and it takes a lot of time to figure out, okay, how much do I have to put in this level, which will get people to upgrade to that. So there's a lot of working on that. But nowadays, there are enough people on Patreon that you can just sort of go and look at a whole bunch of other people and see like, what are they offering? Does that make sense for me to offer? And then piece it together from that. That's what I would recommend. How do you make the connection there? So what's funny is I started my first podcast in 2013. It's like a year before you guys. And Maybe Patreon was around because I only started hearing about Patreon when I came back from the dead, from from hibernation. (laughs) But hearing you guys have been using it for years. So maybe it just wasn't as popular or I just had my head in a hole or something. I don't know. It was small and it started out, I think the founder was in a band and was trying to raise money. So it was a lot of artistic stuff in the beginning. There wasn't as much podcasting, but I think now podcasting might actually be the top thing on it. The really nice thing about Patreon is they give everybody who listens their own RSS feed. So depending on what tier they're in, you can give different access for different things. And then if they leave your Patreon membership, their RSS feed basically gets deactivated. So they sort of do a lot of that legwork for you. It's a very nice outsourcing of delivering of benefits. That's why I like it so much. So what we do is we offer a ad free level which is sort of our mid one. And that's the one that we finally got to be the most popular. This was one where we're like playing with the benefits. The thing that I think put it over the edge was we started doing a different podcast that's only monthly, but it's just for people at ad-free level and up. 
part of the logic is like, well, it's ad free and this new show is going to be ad free too. So you have to be at the ad free level to get it. And we like expand. So that's more general paleontology. It's not just dinosaurs. And then for the lower level, we have access to our discord server and we do extended interviews. So we'll like, I edit the interviews way down, usually to like 20 minutes, but people love hearing all the details that different dinosaur nerds have to share. So we do a longer version. It's still edited. So everybody still start sounds smart and stuff, but there's just a little bit more content in it than I would want to put in a regular podcast episode. What's the kit like on your Patreon? You just say, please donate to our Patreon. Go to like, if you're on your podcast or a newsletter, where's that connection there? I'm starting to figure out, I meant to do some research before this call on, I've never even looked up Patreon, for example. <laughs> Even though I've started several businesses and, and kind of have semi-retired, like there's a ton I don't know about this kind of stuff. So thinking about maybe I should start a Patreon. I don't know. Yeah. So for Patreon, like you said, it's a call to action. So on your show, you say, hey, go here and <laughs> please subscribe. So Patreon is like a website, right? Yes. You would like go to like patreon.com slash I know Dino. Yep. That's exactly what ours is. Okay. And yours would probably be <laughs> patreon.com slash millionaire university. Okay. And then there's a page on there. Yep. Basically what you do on there is you're going to come up with your tiers. And I would say start at at least $3, maybe $5. There's been a lot of inflation and then make some higher tiers too. And then what you need to do, the big tip for Patreon that I have is you need to make content for Patreon. Like you have a hundred patrons. You can't go in with the mindset of, well, I'll start making a bunch of content once I have patrons, because nobody's going to join the Patreon if there's no content. So it's a chicken or egg, just like every business, you got to start out, put a bunch of stuff out there for free, and then hope that you're going to get the returns later. So that's my advice on Patreon. Awesome. Yeah. So you have selected membership level. Yeah. The 499, 99. It's the Utah Raptor. I didn't yep. know that was a thing. It is. It's sort of like, you know, the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park. Uh huh. It's like in real life, Velociraptor was like the size of a chicken or a turkey. But there's a dinosaur called Utah Raptor, which is about the size of that Velociraptor in Jurassic Park. <laughs> really? And did someone, they find it in Utah? Or Yep. That's awesome. Utah has a lot of great dinosaurs. It's one of the best places probably in the world for dinosaurs is Utah. Really? I did not yep. know that. And there's like a Terra. Oh, there's like a Terra dinosaur. My wife's name's Terra. So... She loves dinosaurs. There you go. You got Utah and a Terra Raptor. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So then Triceratops. Okay. Anyway, you just give them different names and then it says what's included. Yeah. And then you have like a little video here. And okay. So you just have them go to this Patreon and then they can sign up to support you guys. Okay. Yep. Cool. In the beginning, we would post all of our free content there too. So every time we made an episode, we would put our episode on there just so that it was sort of filling in the feed and it looked like oh, they're actually doing something. But then once we started doing the ad-free level, once we had ads and we were doing ad-free levels, we just did those episodes so that you still see something at least once a week, usually more often because we do polls for some patrons. You can do all sorts of stuff on Patreon. It's pretty handy. It's less big of a deal for what your goals are. But if your goal is to like quit your job and sort of have like, I'm making some income level, then Patreon can be a nice sort of base level I have some people and it's also like an emotional support thing totally. <laughs> because our discord server that we have has, you know, a couple hundred people in it. I can go in there and just see people talking about the show and that they like it. And if I'm having a day where I'm like having a little difficulty getting going on it, I can read a little bit of that and it really pumps me up to go get work done. How would you compare? So you guys use discord. Some people use Facebook group. Some people use circle. I've gone into discord once to try to use their picture AI art that they have in there. Oh, but I'm like, what is this? We looked at their website. We were designing our website. What is going on here? <laughs> like, yeah. The reason we use Discord is because it integrates with Patreon and ours is only for patrons. So the nice thing about that is we don't really have to do much mod work because people are paying us to go in there. So nobody's going to pay us to like troll us and it's less anonymous in a way. So people are less of a jerk. So that's why I like it so much. And I was talking to somebody also at a recent podcast conference, and they were saying, don't give anything away for free that you're also charging for. So 
that's our community is our discord community. Basically, we don't have a Facebook page, we don't have any other forum for people to talk because we just want to have the one and we want it to be the best one. So that's how we do it. I love it. Have you guys still doing like merch and stuff like that? Yeah, we have it. Actually, it was really fun. One of the ways we made merch was we had a t shirt design contest, where there's this website called T public, you can update or upload your own podcast or any other shirt. (laughs) It doesn't have to be just for a podcast. And then if somebody else sells that shirt, they get a little bit of money for selling it. And you get a little bit of money as the designer. So we told our audience like, hey, everybody that wants to design a shirt, and we'll pick a winner and we'll mail you some prizes and stuff. And we were hoping we get like three or five entrants to this competition but we got like 30 and it was awesome awesome and so we put a bunch of them up in our merch store and i wear these shirts all the time too now because i really enjoy them and it makes me happy but also it supports them a little bit because they get a little cut when they're sold we don't sell that many though i mean podcasting isn't about selling t-shirts there's not a lot of overlap there but yeah that's not your main source of revenue but it helps build the community i mean they talk about a thousand true fans right if you have a thousand true fans you can make it whatever amount of money you need right yeah, exactly. Or however however that goes. <laughs> There's something yeah. about a thousand people giving you money and you're you don't have to work anymore, I think. <laughs> yeah, like if you had a thousand patrons, we're not quite there. Yeah. Cause I think in business, like you're trying to build a general audience, then you're trying to build the core of your audience, which helps they all help each other. Exactly. That's exactly how we look at it too. The podcast is the general audience that's always gonna be for everybody. And then we have if you really want more, you can become a part of this core group. You don't make a ton of money from it, but they're literally wearing your brand. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Then they got to be talking about you and and all kinds of stuff. And so the T public, that sounds like a really easy way to get some merch going, though, if you don't want to figure out how to outsource or whatever, do something on a high level, you can just send them a design and, and there you go type thing or yeah. Yeah, we don't do any inventory because I don't want to deal with inventory. It's a whole other business. Yeah, <laughs> that's not our core competency. We're not going for inventory fulfillment sort of. So yeah, everything we do is produced by somebody else and mailed by them. And you make less money on a per item basis, but I think it's worth it for not having the huge headache. And it's not a huge revenue generator anyway. Totally. And once again, if it's your main business and you want to keep trying to figure out how to improve that, because you're going to make more money overall, like if you change one little thing, it might make you another 10 grand versus, oh, who's going to make me another 20 bucks. Yeah. There's an interesting example. There's this podcast called The Bar Above, a podcast about bartending. And they started making bartending tools that they sold on their podcast. And the bartending tools got so popular that that became their business. So that's an example of you want to do it in-house and it really blew up for them. I saw when I went to your podcast on like Apple, there was a 9.99 subscribe. Is that part of Patreon or you can just do that on with podcasts, right? You can pay to subscribe to commercial free podcasts and stuff like that. Is that what that is? Yes. When that feature became available a year or two ago, I didn't really want to do it because I like having the simple message of like, go to our Patreon. That's where we are. That's where everything is. But my wife convinced me and she is right that you don't want to limit your number of income streams if it's easy to add. So in this case, it was like, okay, I think you pay Apple maybe $20 a year or something. Then they take a 30% cut of all the money you make. So Patreon only takes like less than 10%. So it basically ends up being like a $10 level on Apple is equivalent to like a $750 level on Patreon, which we don't have a level for. So it's different. It's basically just like you were saying, it's just ad free episodes is all it is. But some people listen on iPhones and want just ad free. If they don't care about the other stuff that we offer on Discord and elsewhere, They just want an ad-free version of exactly our show. It's there for them. And we have some people that take it. I was kind of surprised because I was like, why wouldn't you do Patreon? You get so much more for like the same amount of money. (laughs) But Totally. But I think even for me, I mean, I guess if you're listening to the podcast, you're hearing the Patreon CTA quite a bit. But for me, it was just right there. And like, oh, not on podcasts so much, but... I can't say I hate commercials on podcasts because I'm going to be using them soon. But <laughs> Yeah, I do. But, yeah. That's why we offer an okay. ad-free version because I was like, 
it seems disingenuous for me to be like skipping ads and podcasts. I also subscribe to every podcast that has an ad free option. I will do it because I'm like, I'm going to skip your ads. Totally. But if you give me an option to pay you to skip the ads, I'll do it because I want to support the ad free ecosystem. But I realize a lot of people can't afford to do that. Yeah. So it's a win win for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I were watching a show the other day and it made us watch commercials. I'm like, what are we get, get me out of here <laughs> yeah exactly that's how i feel too i'm like i've wasted my time i don't want to be doing this now i actually like listening to podcast ads because i think oh that could be like a future sponsor or how are they doing it you know what i mean it's almost like research for me but yes i do that a little bit now too for sure what's the future look like for you guys we're working on a book so that's like another side thing we might depending on how well the book goes that could be a new pivot thing and I guess we're just trying to grow. We have a young baby. So Congrats. largely, thank you. <laughs> we're mostly just trying to like Survive. continue <laughs> at this pace <laughs> for now. Totally. We're going to get her a daycare soon. And then I think we'll be like, okay, now time to try some more new things. But yeah, it's like you were talking about earlier. It's the monetize and grow sort of cycle. We come up with different things every year. Like earlier this year, we celebrated our eight year anniversary. I said, everybody who is a patron and gives us their address will mail you this patch which is this cool dinosaur that we designed and so that gives you a little bump to your growing numbers at least on in terms of membership so we like coming up with stuff like that awesome any final words to anyone out there who wants to make the jump but is a little scared or nervous or doesn't know what to do what would be your one piece of advice to them I would say, like we were saying earlier, find something you're really passionate about. And if you really enjoy it, and especially if you're interviewing people who you might not get a chance to talk to anyway, you are going to have a good time. And even if a year or two from now, you decide like, oh, this isn't going to make any money. This isn't going anywhere. I've got other stuff to do. You'll still be happy you did it because you got to have a lot of fun. You got to talk to a lot of cool people and you were not just grinding at something you didn't enjoy. And you learned a ton along the way. Yeah. I mean, I say this all the time, but people go to school for four to 12 years and they celebrate when they leave with a pile of debt. And <laughs> yeah, because the goal was not to necessarily get rich. The goal was to learn. But if you can reverse engineer that and say, I want to try to like make a living out of this, but I'm going to learn from it along the way and hopefully have some fun with it. If you have that perspective, you won't feel like you failed and then you won't be like, oh, I'm out. Yep, very true. Check out I Know Dino, the podcast, I know dino.com as well. Yeah, this is an awesome show, especially if you love dinosaurs. If you don't, it's still awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, we're back. Hey, guys, what's going on? Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Garrett is a total stud. We just jammed and jived. Even though him and I have totally different personalities, I felt like we really connected. In fact, Tara and I were listening to this episode yesterday afternoon just to kind of check it out before publishing it, and we couldn't stop. Tara and I both were fascinated. I love hearing myself talk. Just kidding. But we were fascinated by what he had to say and the things that we were talking about. So I hope you picked up as much and got as much value out of it as we did. If you love dinosaurs or you just want to check out their podcast to see how they go about doing it, go to iknowdino.com or check out the I Know Dino podcast podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast. If you liked this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend. If you have yet to get our free business course, go to millionaireuniversity.com slash training. And if you have yet to leave us a rating and review, that would be absolutely amazing. In our next episode, you're going to be a fly on the wall as I do a follow-up coaching session with Lenny Tim. If you don't recall or know who Lenny is, him and I first connected in episode 26, where he shared with us how to start a mobility scooter rental business. And then in episode 27, I had him hang out on the call and we did another episode where I am giving him feedback on how to go from a six to a seven figure business owner a six to seven figure entrepreneur. So that was an awesome, but very interesting call. And I haven't yet created the commentary around it. And I've gone back and forth on what to say. So honestly, I'm as interested and curious about what I'm going to say in that episode as you might be. And once again, I don't want to spoil it, but it was a very interesting discussion and it didn't necessarily go or end up exactly how I thought it might or thought it would or should, but I think you'll get a ton of value out of it and it'll help you in your journey of starting and growing your business. In closing, I want to share a quick thought with you. 
Over the weekend, I went with my boys to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where my oldest son, Brogan, competed in a freestyle trampoline competition. On the way home, we had a five-hour delay on our flight, which led us to miss our connecting flight, which led us to being stuck for a day in Chicago. So we decided to make the most of it, and we toured the city. As a part of our adventures for that day, we went on a 90-minute architecture river cruise and learned a ton about the history of the city of Chicago and the architecture and the canal and just everything that went into building that great city and the absolutely insane, amazing incredible buildings and architecture and commerce and everything that Chicago was and still currently is. At the end of the tour, our tour guide left us with this quote by Leo Burnett. Reach for the stars. You may not quite get one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. In short, by following your dreams and creating your own business and creating a life on your terms in your way and creating something amazing for you and your family. If done in the right way, like how we teach you here at Millionaire University, you really have nothing to lose and a whole lot to gain. So get out there, take action where it counts and reach for the stars. I'm not talking about just in your business, but in your family, in your health, in your faith, in everything you do. Be all in, go all in. And I promise you won't regret it. Until next time, this is Justin Williams, your chief money-making officer signing off. Class dismissed.